Welcome everyone to another interview here on Nerd of the Rings. We have a very special guest with us, Mr. Graham McTavish. You've seen him, well, you've seen him in all kinds of stuff, let's be honest. But here on this channel, you guys are probably uh, fondly remembering him as Dwalin from the Hobbit trilogy. Graham, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, my pleasure, my pleasure. Nice to be here. Now, Graham, I, I wanted to first talk about your new venture uh that you're on which is uh you have your own line of bourbon I do. Um, yeah so mctavish yes. spirits um Indeed. i've seen a lot of a lot of uh um images of you kind of touring around the u.s recently um yeah. with yeah. that um so tell how did you how did you come you, you pointed out in one of your interviews that i saw how it's kind of an odd mixture that a scotsman would make american you know kentucky yeah. bourbon so yeah. how did this come about well yeah it's um yes it's it's a sort of longish well not long story but it, it started a long time ago um when i first moved to america uh i i never had bourbon mm -hmm. so this is the first thing you need to know i'd never tasted bourbon um i had this very prejudiced rather arrogant view of what bourbon was from the Scottish perspective or my perspective anyway, which was that essentially it was just American scotch. Gotcha. It was, they couldn't call it scotch. So they just called it something else. So I was, <laughs> I was incredibly ignorant. Right. And I was around at my friend's house, uh, who's a, another a, actor friend of mine, a guy called Nolan North. And he, we'd had dinner and he, um, he invited me to have a bourbon afterwards. And because there wasn't anything else on offer, I said, yeah, sure. And he gave me some. And then I tasted it. And um, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I really, <laughs> really liked it. And uh, I sort of mentioned it to him. And he, he told me what it was. I can't remember now which bourbon it was, which really annoys me. But this was nearly nearly 20 years ago. Oh, wow. And, um, since, and after that, then I became consumed with guilt. Um, I felt like I was cheating on Scotland basically, <laughs> uh, that, um, so I became this sort of closeted bourbon lover. Uh, so I, I just didn't really talk about it, but privately when I would have a drink on my own or in my drink of choice in my drinks cabinet, I would always go for the bourbon mm. and I wasn't even really aware that I was doing it. It was just, this is what I always chose. And then cut to meeting Paul and Connor. And we did a podcast together and that was great. We really enjoyed that. And then they contacted me about starting my own bourbon line, bourbon brand. And Paul says, by the way, Paul's in the chat here. He says it's Rock Hill Farms is the one that you're trying to think of. Oh, right. There you go. Rock Hill Farms. Wow. Well done. Yes. Rock Hill Farms. Um, yeah. And, and, and then they invited me to do that. And I thought, yeah, this sounds like a, fun idea and like with a lot of things i've done in my life um acting being one of them I, I i never really had any plan or um understanding of what i was getting into so like when i went into acting my my ignorance was a sort of blessing really mm -hmm. same with writing uh same with same with a lot of things that that there's a lot to be said for literally knowing nothing when you start doing something um because the more you know in advance, in a way, the more reasons you'll find for not doing it. Ah, so I, yeah. that's just me. Yeah. That's, you know. Makes sense. And so um, with bourbon, I mean, I knew I liked it. And I finally was able to confess that I preferred it mm. to scotch. Now, that's not to say I don't like scotch. I do. But I just prefer bourbon. And so that's the, the sort of shortish version of yeah. why I came to make it. Do you get any flack from the folks back home about making mm, bourbon instead of scotch? Yeah, no, I, no, no, I, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I think that there's a little bit of understandable confusion. Mm. Yeah. You know, like, well, why are you doing that? And then I <laughs> try, to, well, the very short explanation that I give people is I prefer bourbon. And that's, you know, that seems to yeah. cut through any further conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, well, it's because I like it. So, yeah. Uh, and, you know, and and that's, um, I think, uh, along with blissful ignorance, an actual uh, enjoyment of something 
uh, combining those two things together uh, is the recipe for for embarking on almost anything really. Yeah. Uh, acting, writing, directing, producing, you know, anything anything you can think of. If you like what you're trying to to sell or produce or uh, perform, then uh, it makes everything way, 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 way easier. Hmm. Now, here we've got uh, an image of the war chief, uh, which is, there it is. Yeah, there yes. it is. And I have to say, I love the design of the label on this thing. Thank you. Yes, we've just won a gold medal for oh, very nice. the proof, uh, the proof awards, along with um, a gold medal for uh, masked double blind tasting. Oh wow! Ultimately. So yeah, no, we're very, we're very, very, very proud of it. And uh, my friend actually designed the label. Um, I've known her for thirty years. Mm. Uh, a lady yeah. called Emma Quinn, who lives in Edinburgh. And um, she designed that for us, and she's designing all our labels as we as we develop the different expressions that we want to to bring out. Yeah, the labels are are fantastic. She did a wonderful mm. job. Um, yeah. Now, I'm I'm curious. So on the on the other one, on the War Chief one here, yes. Um, yes. it mentions that it's aged for seven years. So I've been I've been really curious about this. So mm. with it having to be aged for seven years, is it like a is this like a seven year waiting process where you find out if it's good or not at the end of seven years or how does that work? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know really. It's not so much that you wait seven years to find out if it's good for it okay. to be classed as a bottled in bond bourbon. It has to be aged for at least four years. Okay. So that's, that's the first thing. And this has that extra, extra aging. And when we were looking at different, different bourbons that we wanted to try, we had this really quite extensive R and D process, mm -hmm. which went on for quite some time, and uh, you know, nearly killed me. But uh, <laughs> it it was um, it was a way of of just honing in on the flavor profile, the mash wow. bill, and all these other little technical things that we wanted. And we we quite early on actually identified this particular mash bill, this flavor profile, as the one that we wanted to do, and we knew we wanted to do. A bottled in bond um because it's that sort of kind of premium quality mm. bourbon and uh, that's what we were really looking at at the time very cool um now i i'm curious how long how long did uh you mention the process of you know trying to figure out uh the profile that you wanted to mm. go for how long did that process take well i mean it started i mean paul and connor began it and then I was brought in when they'd narrowed it down. And I suppose, I can't remember the exact number. It was, it was quite a few that we were tasting. Mm -hmm. And it meant that um, the amount of whiskey that I was consuming in a relatively short space of time was, was, was not uh, something I was used to. Uh, <laughs> but I guess, you know, we started this whole process together about nine, ten months ago. And since then uh the the whiskey itself has been launched for about three months so yeah. we are um we are we are very young in terms of being in the marketplace um but it's it's been a boy it's it's been a learning process good grief mm. i mean just just having something that is a business yeah. that is completely divorced from anything i've ever been used to uh gives me a huge appreciation for anybody that not only runs their own business but also runs anything to do with retail and, mm. and distribution and get all of these things that we completely take for granted yeah I mean, everything that we consume on a daily basis has had to go through this extraordinary process to get it in front of us and and i've been learning that along with paul and connor i mean paul, paul and connor knew more about it than I did, but mm -hmm. they, you know, we all started this at the same time, the business yeah. together. So we've been, um, we've been learning on the hoof, as they say. And it's, uh, it's, it's been great, actually, it really has. It's been very exciting. And one of the lovely things about the bourbon community um, is that they're very, very welcoming, you know? Mm. I mean, it's, it's like any business, it's a competitive marketplace, but the overriding concern that people have in that world 
is that the bourbon is good. Yeah. That's they just want the drink to be good. Yeah. And you know, your success means that what you're offering is good. Mm. And uh and that's that's something that I was really pleased to see actually. We went to the Bourbon and Beyond Festival in Kentucky earlier this year and yeah. everyone everyone was so supportive right from you know people with incredibly well established brands like Pappy mm -hmm. Van Winkle all of these kind of people the uh, brothers bond with um with Ian Summerholder people like that they, they all just came together and were like we're so pleased about what you're doing and you know i've got to say it there's, there's not a lot of businesses that yeah. like that so yeah it's good yeah it's nice when you when you find ones that are for sure um yeah. I'm curious, uh, how did you come up with the name? The War Chief and the Keeper are the two names well, of the, the two drinks you have yeah. so far. I mean, look, um, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, words, names are very important. Um, and the War Chief is just, look, it's a really cool word. It, it is. Just is. <laughs> it's just a cool word. And I've played a War Chief. You have. In Outlander. And it's just, it's just got weight. Yeah, it's got weight. It's serious. Um, you know, it's not advocating armed conflict necessarily, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but it's there if you need it. You know, yeah. it's, this is this is this is yeah, this is a, this is a serious bourbon. And with the keeper, um, again, this is obviously a nod to uh, my experience on the Hobbit, um, mm. where my two axes. You've got the double axes, yeah. Yeah, they were called Grasper and Keeper, and uh, uh -huh. and I mean, I think the Grasper wouldn't have been such a good fit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> was, you know, by the Grasper, <laughs> you're feeling like a wee drink. Get the Grasper down your throttle. Yeah, it just <laughs> it, it it's just not the same. Yeah, I mean, it's, a... it's it's a different market. You know, you're yes. appealing to a different group, right? Um, whereas the Keeper. I mean, it's got so many connotations to it, mm -hmm. the word, the word to keep it. And, um, and we wanted something different, but the same, if that makes any sense, um, as the war chief. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was the thinking behind that. Now I, I saw a lot of folks, um, posting on Instagram and stuff, people who've been at these events where mm. they've sampled your stuff, uh, mentioned mm. that this is actually, um, I, I think they were talking about the war chief, but it might have been the keeper where they were saying mm. this is a really good drink, uh, not not only for people experienced drinking bourbon, but like for newbies to try. What sure. what kind of advice would you have for someone who who doesn't know anything about bourbon? Um, how would you how would you describe this to them? Oh, how would you describe this particular yeah. bourbon? Yeah. Well, I guess hmm, yeah, it's the the mash bill, which is. 75% corn, 21% rye, and 4% uh, malted barley. The rye, which is gives it the, the designation of a high rye in the bourbon world, mean, the rye gives it a spiciness, mm. which balances the sweetness of the corn. So it's, it's, got, it's got a really interesting finish that um, that, that rye allows you, right? Mm. And uh, I guess there are notes of... I don't know, cinnamon, uh, sort of Christmassy fruit cake. In fact, somebody who who drank it described it as Christmas in a glass, mm. uh, which is which good. is a really brilliant description of it, actually. <laughs> um, especially at this time of the year. Yeah. You know, drinking this in front of a fire on a cold night, you know, family, friends. Uh, like scotch, I think bourbon is a great communal drink. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can drink it on your own. That's fine. But I, I think it's um, it's a great sort of family, friends sort of experience as well. And so, yeah, cinnamon, it's got vanilla in it. Uh, you could get notes of maybe tobacco in there. Um, maybe also, I mean, the, n tasting notes are, are very individual. You know, you, what you would taste and how you would describe it wouldn't necessarily be the same as how mm. I would describe it. And when we've done tastings with people, we get a, a quite a wide array of 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 words to describe mm. the taste of it. 
Um, but I guess the 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 main thing is people really seem to like it, which is <laughs> that's it's kind that's, of the biggest part. Yeah, <laughs> that's what we're going for, and and actually very gratified that the rye, where we we were at a, a bourbon festival, uh, in uh, in Texas um, earlier this year, and th people were loving both. Some preferred the bourbon, some preferred the rye, and it's just that. Um, it's it's what your palate enjoys, really. Mm. And fortunately, it seems that, you know, in terms of the people who have reviewed the whiskey and, and people who have consumed it just as as uh, as casual bourbon drinkers, they seem to all like it. So that's very yeah. gratifying. Now, I did ask uh, your social, the McTavish Spirit social media team on, mm. um, it was either on Instagram or, or Twitter or something. I, I asked if, you know, what, there was a rumor that what was special about these is that they're they're actually aged in barrels that you have personally uh, traveled in down a river. Is there any validity to that rumor? Well, I mean, I don't want to give away all. Oh yeah, your secret. There are things that we're keeping close to our chest. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, um, there was there was some white water involved. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, another a good thing, you know, you mentioned getting around the fire with uh with a glass of your bourbon um i am i immediately pictured myself reading a book and you just happened to very recently uh mm. release a book it was very fortuitous i got this in the mail the same day the same day that i got richards in the mail so i thought that was oh, pretty, you got richards. I haven't pretty read appropriate richards. um yeah. yeah i'm just i'm just getting ready to start in on his but mm. uh mm. but yeah so so you you and sam uh wrote a book and you did a a travel yeah. series in New Zealand. Yeah. And yeah. Um, you're one of those, it seems like uh, just about everybody who goes there really, this happens to, but it, it seems, um, I, I was talking to John Rees Davies on the channel here yeah. recently, and um, he now, you know, splits his time between um, Isle of Man and New Zealand. And it seems yeah. like a lot of people who go down there and, you know, work on these films become enchanted with that, with that country. Yeah. What is it about New Zealand that, um, that you've come to love? Well, I, th I guess it, it, listen, it's, it's got, um, it's advantage and disadvantage is that it's, it's very far from anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so when you're here, you have, feel a sense of containment and, uh, calm and peace. And, uh, you feel like the world is, is another, is another place. Mm. That you're in, you're in, you're in your own special world here, uh, a world that, you know, was described in, you know, the the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit uh, in, in the mid terms of Middle Earth. But they used the landscape of New Zealand to create that mm -hmm. uh, cinematically, and and there is something magical about the country. Uh, I think the fact that there were no humans here until uh, the Maori arrived in the 14th century yeah so you know there was no people here yeah and so it grew in a way that was unique yeah um i'm sorry that's my phone going off I don't oh, know sorry. It <laughs> um but oh uh, no i'll just decline that there you go uh yeah um it, it grew in a unique way yeah. And it continues to have that sense of uniqueness when you when you come here. There are things about it that you feel are very familiar in terms of, you know, like if you go to Scotland and you come to the South Island of New Zealand, as as we talk about mm. in the book, uh, there are many things where you go, oh, I could be in Scotland. Yeah. But then there are things that make you go, but not quite. Mm. I'm not quite in Scotland. What's that weird tree? <laughs> and what's that weird bird? You know, um, why aren't there any mammals that are yeah. around, you know, apart from sheep and stuff? But there were no mammals here, apart from yeah. the bat. And so all of that led to a story that um, has, has made New Zealand very special. And I always compare it to um, J.M. Barry's description of Neverland. Mm. Peter Barry. Uh, and he describes Neverland as a place where you're never far from an adventure. And that's what New Zealand is like because it it's like a child's drawing of an island, a perfect island. You probably did this when you were a kid. I know I did. You would draw an island and the island would contain everything you would need to have an incredible time. 
So there would be waterfalls and volcanoes, and then there would be beaches and mountains and mm -hmm. fields and all this. And New Zealand has all of those things. Yeah. And so it is like it's popped out of the imagination of a child. And that's great. Yeah. And obviously, like you mentioned, it uh, embodied Middle Earth perfectly uh, across yeah. those six movies. Um, yeah. I'm curious, how, how were you first introduced to Tolkien? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, how was I first introduced? Well, um, I didn't read The Hobbit when I was a child. I didn't. I, I read The Lord of the Rings first. Mm. So I read those probably when I was about 17, 18. Okay. And I read all three just straight through. And I thought, for me anyway, it was the perfect age to encounter those stories. And once I'd read The Lord of the Rings, because in my mind, The Hobbit was a children's book, right. I kind of went, oh, well, you know. I'm, yeah. I'm not gonna read it. So, in fact, I didn't read it until um, I got the job. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. No, no, I hadn't read it at all. Um, and so it was The Lord of the Rings that really introduced me to the world of Tolkien. And... Uh, I just, did you see that? I, I, I saw this wonderful clip of an interview with Tolkien where he talks about how he began The Hobbit. Did you see that? Oh, yeah. Like on the back of a, of a, uh, it was an term exam paper. paper. Yeah. Yeah. Exam paper. Yeah. Yeah. Th there was a blank sheet in the exam paper. Yeah. And he thought this was brilliant. This was, this was just fantastic. And, and such was his way of thinking and his imagination that, that that black piece of paper acted as an inspiration and drew from him almost the yeah. story that was waiting to come out. I, I find that the idea that we carry within us these stories that need expressing. Mm. Uh, and if you're lucky enough to be able to articulate that yeah. in, in the written form, then you know, you're, you're talking. But um, the fact that he saw that piece of paper and, it, and his first thought was, oh, well, you know, just throw it away. Yeah. Like, oh, what does an empty piece of paper mean? And it means the start of an adventure. And I, I just, I love that. I love that. That's I don't great. know. What anyway. Oh, that's great. Um, so, so you read Lord of the Rings. So when, yeah. when you're, uh, you know, do yeah. you, it, I, okay, let me phrase this a different way than I was going to, but if, if you had your pick of middle earth characters to play, so like, let's wipe the slate clean, Aside from Dwalin, mm. who would you pick out of all the Middle Earth characters? Well, I mean, you know, the hero to me when I was reading these books, mm -hmm. when I was a teenager, was Aragorn. You know? mm. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I never had any desire to be an elf. Mm -hmm. um, it's just never, yeah. yeah. Which stood me in good stead when I became a dwarf. Right. Uh, yeah. But, they're not all the yeah elves are i mean whatever yeah. they're they're annoying they're just yeah. annoying you know they speak really slowly and they're kind of you know too ethereal it's just yeah, yeah. It's kind of annoying. They're, they think but, very highly of themselves they do yeah. they do they do um whereas yeah um aragorn i just i just love that character yeah i mean who wouldn't want to play aragorn yeah really? god <laughs> i mean it's fantastic what a role yeah. Now, um, obviously, like uh, you guys have had uh, a lot of behind the scenes footage and stuff shown of your days in The Hobbit. Do mm -hmm. you have do you have a particular favorite memory from, you know, that you look back on and uh, with particular fondness of filming those films? Gosh, I mean, my God, it's absolutely packed with memories, that experience, really. Um, I think. Weirdly. It was a little bit the same with Outlander. You know, the, the time that we had before we started filming was among the most enjoyable. Because once you're into the filming, it's, you know, I mean, you've got to go in, you've got to get into makeup, you've got to get into costume, you've got to be ready, then you, yeah. you're, you're camera ready, you go on, you do what you have to do, and you're fighting, whatever it is you're doing. And and those days become weeks and those weeks become months. But the 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 preparation you know, dwarf boot camp was mm, yeah um, was great. I mean, I, I and I do have a, <laughs> uh, talking of Richard a, a memory of um, 
when we were we were doing dwarf movement mm. with Terry Notary, and um, and we would practice like dwarven greetings, and which is where the headbutt came from, actually. That I oh, remember. nice, yeah, yeah. That was one of the things that we experimented with as a way that dwarves would greet each other. Uh, and anyway, so on this particular day, we'd been doing all this dwarf movement inside a sports hall, and we were given our our boots our dwarf boots, which, you know, they went through many changes because at first they were just so heavy, so big. Mm. Um, but anyway, we were given these boots and Terry announced that we were going to go to this local park and behave like dwarves. Right? <laughs> and, you know, I mean, we were so sick of the sports hall that we were like, yeah, great, great. We get to go outside. Fantastic. <laughs> and then we go out. And we're um, we're in these boots, and we're on this park. It's near Stone Street Studios. It's a sort of hilly park, mm. and there's Richard. Uh, and Terry's instructions were okay. Richard, as the leader of the dwarves, is going to be instructing you what to do um, in dwarvish, <laughs> and you're going to be doing what he's telling you to do. So you know, flanking movements, charging, you know, hiding, you know, all of this kind of battle stuff. <laughs> and um, we're in a park and. You know, I mean, this is classic New Zealand, really. There are there are people just walking their dogs, right? <laughs> you know, couples enjoying a nice sunny walk in in a beautiful part of the of the city. You know, people reading books, people having their lunch, and then there's this group of thirteen men running around <laughs> in massive boots, all shouting like "Kula ka, kula ka," and just sort of running along. And and what was remarkable was that people didn't seem to bat an eyelid. <laughs> completely normal, but completely normal for men in huge outsized boots to be running around shouting in a foreign, foreign, unintelligible language. Um, and we did that. And it was um, that was a really fun memory from early on, actually. All of that stuff that we did, the dwarf movement, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, 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 the dwarf language classes, the stunt, the stunt rehearsals the the physical stuff that we had to do but we really bonded together yeah then and we were lucky because we weren't in makeup and costume right so we had a, a freedom uh while getting to know each other and the characters that we're going to be playing now uh we talked about your your double axes earlier did you get to keep those after filming oh yes nice yes. I do. I have them in my office, actually. They're in my office. Oh, nice. That's a great, uh, great spot for them. They, well, listen, I, I have a, a collection of weapons from various shows that I've been in. Yes. It's right. like an arsenal of, <laughs> of, of, of props from, from shows. Yeah. It's great. I love it. I, I, lo I love, I love that sort of thing. So, but my, my axes were, we were all given our weapons on the last day. In this big ceremony, we've got our Lego figure, right? Our yeah. I mean, and it was look, you know, I mean, as a as a child growing up, all of these things are things that you dream of, you know, uh, Lego weapons. Just it's just it's childhood stuff, yeah. and uh, all of us at that moment were transported back to when we were we were kids uh, when they gave us those things. Yeah. Now, I, I know that people in the chat right now will be wondering this. So I had to follow this up with, do you still have the Lego figure? I do. Good. Okay. I do. I, have the Lego figure. As awesome as the, uh, you know, the, the axes are, I know that, you know, we'd probably have a pretty good split of people who would love their own weaponry and people who would love themselves as a Lego figure. Like oh, those are both pretty awesome no. things. Listen, listen. I, I mean, I, I love having the axes given to me. But when I was given a Lego figure of myself, yeah, nothing, nothing comes close, actually. Nothing. You know, there's been other figures, you know, like Weta produces beautiful statues of mm -hmm. characters and, and all this sort of stuff. But but that Lego figure, we all got it. We all got one. And oh my goodness, I just I love it so much. I've yeah. heard I've, you know, I I'm sure that uh you know, people like Meryl Streep are probably jealous. You know, they have Oscars. Sure, that's one yeah. thing. But like, 
you don't have a Lego figure, then what's the point? Yeah, they should be jealous. Right. They should be jealous. You know, I, I'm, you know, my Lego figure totally stands head and shoulders above an Oscar, even though actually physically the Oscar <laughs> would be a little bit taller. But, you know, just just metaphorically, it's it's bigger. It's yes. just way bigger, way more important. <laughs> yeah. Now, you mentioned all the, the weaponry that you have from the various shows. I was going to bring this up as well because I, I brought this up at the top of the, the uh, interview here. But, I mean, gosh, we've just off the top of my head, we've got, you know, The Hobbit, obviously, we've talked about. Uh, saw you in The Witcher, Outlander, House of the Dragon. Like, there's all these great mm. fantasy properties mm. that you've been a part of. You kind mm. of, you seem like, uh, you know, you're the guy to call when someone's wanting to do some epic fantasy. Um, yeah. yeah. You, you've it's had funny. quite, quite the, the road here. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It's, um, I mean, I, I suppose there's somewhat possibly of the sort of laws of attraction, you know, that mm -hmm. I myself enjoy that genre. Yeah. You know, I, I love reading fantasy. I love watching it. I think fantasy gives us, um, really interesting way of dealing with our own world it provides um it provides safety i think and surety mm -hmm. uh, i think that fantasy you know terrible things can happen in fantasy books and fantasy films and people die and everything but in the end good triumphs mm -hmm. and i think that's just such a really strong powerful message for for people who enjoy those things mm -hmm. And certainly I'm, I'm, I'm one of them. So being involved in them, you know, I, I absolutely love it. It's, yeah. it's great. You know, I, I, I don't know if I've ever done a job where I've got like an iPhone or a briefcase, <laughs> maybe, but mainly it's cloaks, swords, yeah. horses, candles, you know, which are way more fun, which yeah, are way very more analog, fun. Yeah. very analog world that I live in. Yeah. Are there like are there any fantasy worlds that you know that maybe you're a fan of or or that you've seen and you you think, oh, that'd be really fun to be a part of? Well, um, I mean, I suppose uh, I mean science fiction wise, you know, Star Wars, the Star Wars mm. universe obviously is something. Um, and I grew up I grew up with the the Marvel universe and the DC mm. universe as a child with comics and all of those sort of things. And there's a there's a series of books written by a man who's become a friend of mine now actually called Joe Abercrombie, and he's written a a series uh, well a number of series actually but the first one was the first Law trilogy um, and they're just just crying out to be made mm. in television program and they're trying they're trying to make a few of his things into into TV and films but they are they are brilliant and i love immersing myself in the world that he creates so that would be something that i would crawl over broken glass to be a part of yes well i think it sounds like you would have an inside track since you know the guy now like surely he could I'm put in a good word pretty for much you. on a daily basis yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now, now um you mentioned uh star wars and i don't know i don't know how much you know, I think it, it probably depends on the person, how much you, you see rumors and, you know, fan speculation and stuff. Um, so there was an Ahsoka show recently and tragically uh, Ray Stevenson, phenomenal actor, uh, passed away yeah. in May after yes. um, he created I, I he was my favorite character in the show, this uh, Balin Skull. And mm. a lot, you know, they've people of Lucasfilm have talked about recasting the character and stuff. And a lot of fans have been, you know, posting images like of, of you saying, Hey, Graham would be a great person to, to take on this role. Mm. Um, is, is that so, have you seen any of those happen to see those fan rumors? Is that something you would find interesting or uh, appealing to do? Sure. I mean, Absolutely. I would absolutely find that very appealing to do. Um, you know, I'm a fan of that, that world completely. I, I, you know, one of the most sort of powerful seminal moments of my teenage life was going to see the first Star Wars film mm. when it came yeah. out in 1977. Uh, I went there for my 16th birthday. Never, never forget it. I will never, ever forget the experience. So 
to be even considered for it yeah. would be a huge honor. I mean, I don't really follow the fan things so yeah. much. Yeah. Um, Sometimes just, that's for the best. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, um, I, I don't really look into that sort of thing too much, yeah. but, but certainly, um, you know, I, I had the pleasure of, of working with Ray uh, when we did Rome together uh, mm. about, gosh, be nearly 20 years ago now, actually. Um, lovely guy and a great actor. Great actor. Terrible loss, actually. It was, yeah. Terrible loss. Um, far too young. I'm, uh, it's very sad. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, you know, Star Wars, who knows? Who knows what the future holds? We shall see. Well, let, yeah, we will certainly uh, we'll certainly hope so, because I'd love to see you in Star Wars. That's another one for me that you know, when, when I saw then Lord of the Rings, you know, gosh, however many years after I first saw Star Wars, it was kind of like lightning struck twice, you know, for me. Um, what, what about you? So, you know, uh, when did you see the Lord of the Rings trilogy and what did you think about it back then? Well, I, I watched it when it came out. Um, right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was among the first people to go to the cinema, and and one of the strange kind of wonderful things that brought me full circle, I suppose, was I went to see the Lord of the Rings, each one of the trilogy, mm -hmm. um, at the Odeon Leicester Square, mm. and then cut yeah. to ten or so years later, and I was walking down the red carpet of the Odeon Leicester Square for the premiere of of um the first Hobbit movie. yeah so uh that was that was an amazing moment um one that i could never have imagined happening actually and uh that was that was when i saw them and i got i mean the same as you i yeah. i watched those and i was just blown away totally blown away um what what an achievement yeah by by peter and the team that made those in the face of so many difficulties you know mm -hmm. i think we all assume like star wars we all assume that these things just sort of smoothly go along and oh it was inevitable that these great movies were going to be made but but no they had to overcome massive yeah. obstacles huge and uh and I, it's 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 a huge testimony to those kind of visionary people like lucas and peter jackson that 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 they just they're just bloody minded that's the only way of describing it. They just won't give up. Same with Stallone, you yeah. know, when, when he did Rocky. Just, oh, yeah. Just driven, driven people. And I, yeah. I hugely admire that. Well, um, I know we're we're getting close on our time here. I did want to ask, you know, we as we're talking about uh, potential movie projects and Middle Earth in particular, I know Warner Brothers has some... Uh, um, it's rumored that they're going to be making another few films. So nobody knows what those are going to be yet, but just, you know, throwing out wild ideas here. I will mention that Dwalin is one of the oldest uh, dwarf. Like he, he lives for 340 years. I don't know if you knew that. So oh. if, if there was ever, you know, a project that came up and you had a chance to revisit Dwalin, I, this might be a silly question, but would you, would you be up for revisiting Dwalin? Of course, of course. He was such such a huge part of my life, mm. and um, I mean, I actually developed a huge affection for Dwalin. Um, same with same with Dougal in in Outlander. That those kind of people, very sort of black and white people. You mm. know, it's just there's no gray areas in their lives. Yeah, and 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 that that's what makes them, I I think, so compelling. Yeah, um, that they're they're not burdened with any of the sort of doubt that so many people have. They're not going to be they're not going to be playing Hamlet anytime soon. Yeah, they're <laughs> they're like no, and so absolutely dwelling. Oh, and if he ever came back into my life, I would love that. Love it. Put the boots back on. Get the You've big. Still got on. the axes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't bring my own axes. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> All right, yeah. folks. Well, uh, that's about all the time we have. I will ask one last rapid fire question here. Mm -hmm. um, I already, I think we probably touched on this, but I, I was going to ask what your favorite Middle Earth character is. Um, obviously, I think you, you've 
mentioned Aragorn, you've mentioned Dwalin. Is there any other, or is that that pretty much covers it? Um, well, you know, I mean, I mean, Gandalf, of course, mm. is, you know, just extraordinary, extraordinary character. So complicated. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, but forever, ever, forever, you associate Ian with that character. Yes. Yeah. Forever. And then what about um, a place in Middle Earth that you would want to live? I mean, I know that you are pretty much in Middle Earth at the moment as we're talking here. So you kind of live in Middle Earth already. I do. Um, where would I live? Well, I mean, Erebor's got some sort of difficult memories, obviously. Yeah. You know, some awkward things occurred in Erebor. Uh, I think, well, you know, Hobbiton... It's it's just it's just very beautiful. Yeah, you know, you're not you do when you walk around a place like Hobbiton, which of course actually does exist here in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, you you feel so safe and just sort of warm and cozy. It's uh, that's that's a it's a I think it would be a great place to retire to. Mm. Yes, that's yes. great. All right, folks. Well, um, that's going to do it for this interview today. Um, be sure to visit mctavishspirits.com so you can um, check out the War Chief and the Keeper, named after Dwell and Zax. Um, nice. And look at, uh, you can find on there, I would presume, um, you know, some locations where you can look for or order the, uh, the bourbon for yourself. Yes. Yeah. It's online, online in I think forty-three states in America and retail currently, uh, Texas, uh, Wisconsin, and Kentucky, and we're going to be moving into other states in the new year. So, Perfect. And in the UK, we're in the UK as well. Okay, great. Yeah, and so you so you can order online. That's perfect. You most definitely can. Excellent. All right, guys. Well, check it out, McTavishSpirits.com. Graham, thanks so much for uh, taking some time out of your schedule and joining us and chat. My pleasure. Lovely talking to you. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.